doing good quality rigorous research, but research that addresses challenges that we face. Uh, I think there's also space for doing like esoteric research that you just find interesting. But personally, what I find more fulfilling is using those tools around knowledge generation, knowledge production to address challenges that we face. And we have a lot of them. And then catalyzing a shift in thinking uh, and empowering other people too, giving a platform for others. So for me, I think that's the, that's ultimately what I really aspire to do. Hello and welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle, and success from women professionals in different fields across the globe, bound to inspire young professionals. I'm Sahib Singh Chadha, Research Assistant and Project Coordinator in the Asia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And today I'll be speaking with Dr. Zainab Usman, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program at CEIP. Her fields of expertise include institutions, economic policy, energy policy, and emerging economies in Africa. Her latest book, Economic Diversification in Nigeria, The Politics of Building a Post-Oil Economy, has recently been published. We're privileged to have you with us today, Dr. Usman. In your professional career, you've given several interviews, taken part in several conversations on substantive issues of public policy. But my goal here today is not just to learn about your professional journey, but also your personal journey. So on that note, let me start. So could you uh, tell us about your journey from 2008 at the Ahmadu Bello University in Nigeria to becoming the inaugural director of the Africa program at Carnegie in 2021? What's your assessment of this long journey of 13 years and the transition from Nigeria to the United States? Yeah, well, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Um, I I was born and raised in Nigeria. Um, so I, uh, I went to university there, meaning that I studied for my first degree there, initially starting with the international relations and then uh, eventually making a gradual shift to focus more on economics. So now the work that I do is mostly political economy, where I look at the intersection of politics and economics and how those two shape policy outcomes. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, 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 I did my first degree in Nigeria, uh, um, uh, you know, did a national service. There are countries that do national service after you graduate from university, and Nigeria is one of them. I think Israel also does it, and a number of others. Um, then I moved to the UK for graduate school, um, went to the University of Birmingham, uh, and then later to the University of Oxford, uh, where I did my PhD in international development. Again, looking at that intersection of economics and politics, um, and, and focusing on uh, resource-rich countries in Africa, the challenges that they face and, you know, how they can move forward. Uh, so from the World Bank, uh, sorry, from the University of Oxford, uh, in 2016, I moved to the US uh, to start work with the World Bank as part of the Young Professionals Program. Um, and I was there for a couple of years until 2021, early 20, 2021, when I joined the Carnegie Endowment as the founding director of the Africa program. Um, so a lot of the work that I did at the World Bank, as well as what I did in grad school, is kind of what I'm doing now, still looking at economic development uh, in African countries and how politics and uh, uh, other social issues shape um, economic and development outcomes. And also very importantly, how we can influence policymakers towards um, 
you know, policies and initiatives that can advance Africa's economic development. Uh, so that kind of is, uh, in a nutshell, my journey and uh, how I got here today. That that sounds like a very fascinating journey. And I want to probe further on one aspect. You said you did national service. So what sort of national service? Do you mean the military or something else? Yeah. So in, in Nigeria, um, once you graduate from a from a tertiary education institution, any higher education institution, you have to do the mand- a mandatory one year national service. It's a right. it's a paramilitary. It's a combination of things. It's a there's a paramilitary element of it, which lasts for about two to three weeks, in which you actually go to some kind of paramilitary camp. You know, you do some trainings. You have to wake up very early. Do the drills with. Uh, soldiers. Uh, it's actually a very interesting and a very difficult experience, but a very interesting one. And then after those three weeks, you do like an internship with an organization, whether in the public sector or in the private sector. Um, and in a way, it kind of helps um, introduce people into the labor market in a sense, uh, giving you your first job. Uh, as you know, Nigeria is a middle-income country and I believe there might be some similarities with India where jobs are not always guaranteed for people so that national service kind of gives you at least something to hang on to maybe an internship like experience such that when you're done maybe the organization can decide to give you a full-time job offer Um, and I think there's one other element to it that uh, you do the national service in a region of the country that is not your home region uh, with the idea that it can help foster better understanding, given that Nigeria is a very diverse country, religiously, ethnically, uh, etc. So that really, is a, in a nutshell, is what the national service is about. Right. What you're saying makes sense. Even in India, the military is like a lucrative economic opportunity, you know, given the economic conditions. Mm-hmm. So along this uh, journey, were there any notable experiences you had that would help us understand the challenges you faced as a woman and as a person of color? Um, So, you know, it's interesting. I, identity is always an interesting thing. Um, uh, Of course, you know, I'm someone who fits in the category of a minority um, here in the US, but also just generally, um, you know, in the professional world. Uh, as a woman, as a person of color. And uh, sometimes that can be potentially a handicap. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think uh, it can also be uh, a useful way of bringing uh, new perspectives to longstanding issues, just based on my own experience, based on uh, my upbringing and the way that I see the world. Uh, So personally, I've just chosen not to see it as a handicap. Um, and to see that as an asset in the sense that I can bring different perspectives to uh, a conversation. Um, Maybe the other thing I'll add is that, um, and here I'm not bringing any specific uh, experience to bear, but, you know, ultimately for me, I always place high premium on the quality of the work that I produce. So quality is very, very important to me because ultimately, um, you know, my credibility is what is at stake. It's the most important thing to me, uh, the name that I'm building based on that quality of work. So it's something that I really don't compromise on. And of course, that has its own downsides that uh, sometimes, you know, you're writing a paper or something, it takes a bit, a bit longer than normal, but it's better to do the right checks to make sure that whatever analysis we do Uh, It's rooted in rigorous uh, analysis. It's rooted in good evidence, uh, data, uh, to make sure that, you know, we maintain our credibility. So for me, that is very very important. And, you know, as a person of color, ultimately, it is that credibility that I'll always rely on. The the progress I've made so far is really based on that. Of course, uh, luck plays a role here and there. You know, people give you opportunities having allies, also people who can see where you're coming from and open doors for you. All of those are important, but that credibility rooted in the quality of work that one does is absolutely crucial. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, continuing with your work, so your mantra seems to be doing, thinking, and writing economic policy. So, when and how did public policy become a part of this journey of yours, and what impact has it had on you? So, you know, um, what I've come to realize is that many people like me, who come from, you know, a low-income country or a middle-income country. Would um, and and as long as they have some kind of social science background, even if they don't have a social science background, they always would be interested in policy, because you can see the problems all around you. You grew up with a lot of these problems, uh, whether you grew up in poverty. So I I didn't grow up in poverty. I'm not going to make that claim, but I also was not rich. Uh, so I was just kind of somewhere in the middle, and I could see. You see that in your environment, right? You see deprivation, you see inequalities, you see the governance challenges. And in the case of Nigeria, uh, which is a an oil-rich country, uh, that you know, should have been able to harness that oil wealth uh, to propel uh, you, you, the, the the economy towards a uh, higher income higher levels of development that hasn't quite happened you know you're b- bound to ask why why is this the case mm-hmm. uh so for me that was always a question why is just why is nigeria underperforming uh why have the resources not translated into sustained development higher incomes for people uh improved well-being uh so that question has always been there for me and that informed my decision to even go to grad school because I was thinking of that question in my early 20s and eventually that was really what I focused my PhD on uh, and that uh, was uh, eventually published uh, as a book uh, just a few um, weeks ago. So it's just like growing up in that environment, having lived through that experience and just trying to see how to do things differently. That is the, I guess that is the motivation for going into policy. Yeah, and it sounds like a strong motivation. And my next question was going to be about, you know, what is it about energy specifically that gathers your interest? And you mentioned, you know, Nigeria and the oil resource richness, but was there anything else that specifically motivated this interest towards energy? In addition to um, just Nigeria being an oil-rich country and all of the uh, you know, all of the missed opportunities for Nigeria. I would also say that I I think I've always been interested in things that have to do with like nature and the environment. So a focus on natural resources uh, and then of course energy related to that. You know, for me that was always a very interesting intersection to focus on. Uh, with respect to energy specifically, um, so when you when you work on oil and gas, you know, eventually it kind of uh, segues into work on energy, given that oil and gas is a major source uh, of uh, our power generation, uh, for example. I think, but the other aspect is that um, you, you cannot think of modern economic development in any country, in any part of the world, without realizing that energy is core to that whether energy in terms of electricity, whether energy in terms of the infrastructure, or whether energy in terms of just the sources for power generation, where where those energy sources are derived, and the, 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 the regional politics, the geopolitics associated with all of that, right? So for me, it's that intersection of, you know, the focus on oil, oil rich countries, uh, the focus on like environment and natural resources, and then the focus on energy as a catalyst for economic transformation in any society. So that really is the intersection of interest for me, and that's what my work, uh, my own uh, professional expertise is anchored on. Right. So, yeah, you talked about your book. And so I want to dig deeper a bit on the book. So what encouraged you to write economic diversification in Nigeria, the politics of building a post-oil economy, and where did the idea for it sort of originate? 
the idea itself um, is, you know, it, it came from, as I mentioned earlier, the questions that I had been asking for yeah. actually over a decade now. Um, and the questions that informed my uh, uh, doctorate work at the University of Oxford. Uh, so the book itself is really, the bulk of the research was done while I was in grad school. And then uh, over the years after I was done, I was at the World Bank, I was still working on it uh, um, infrequently. Uh, you know, I added more research to it. And um, yeah, I decided that there was a gap in knowledge on that front in terms of really looking at economic diversification as the major development challenge for oil rich countries and for resource rich countries more broadly. And the fact that this is a, a topic and a policy objective that is so crucial to this category of countries, not just in Africa, but also around the world, you know, as the world tries to transition towards a low carbon future. Um, yeah, so that really is the, you know, the motivation from the book. Right. So that makes sense. You've spoken a bit about sustainability, uh, you know, better climate futures. So, and you worked on this at the World Bank as well. And recently, your foreign affairs piece mentioned that African states need to invest around 50 billion USD per year in climate adaptation. So, could you tell us a bit more about what are Africa's climate challenges? So, African countries are in a very um, interesting position in the sense that they have contributed very little to the climate challenge, to creating the climate challenge. Uh, today, African countries collectively contribute less than 3%, around 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take out uh, heavy emitting countries that use a lot of coal, like Morocco, um, uh, maybe Algeria, maybe South Africa in particular, the percentage drops to like around 1%. Uh, but despite that minimal contribution, African countries suffer disproportionately from climate impacts. Uh, you have extreme weather events, floods, droughts, um, all of those things going on. Um, and, you know, a lot of the countries, a lot of the 55 countries on the continent, more than a third, I would say, are low income countries. Some are very, very small, some are in situations of fragility, they just don't even have the resources to be able to build the resilient infrastructure uh, needed to be able to uh, survive through these extreme climate impacts. Uh, so the continent is heavily affected, but a lot of the countries just don't even have the resources to be able to adapt to climate change. Um, maybe another aspect of the challenge is that for African countries, therefore, uh, the key issue is not for them to mitigate emissions right now because there are no emissions to mitigate. <laughs> they're, they're emitting very little carbon, very little greenhouse gases. The key issue is actually to make that transition from poverty to higher levels of prosperity, to increase incomes, uh, to be able to generate more revenue and more resources so that they can adapt to the impacts of climate change. And I worry that in the global discourse on climate change, the way the challenge for wealthy advanced countries is framed is kind of forced down on African countries, whereas the challenge for African countries, and indeed quite a number of other countries around the world, is very, very different. Right? There are differentiations in terms of how the climate challenge looks and what the policy solutions are. So I'm hoping that the work that we do, in addition to the work that other people are doing in other organizations, can help recenter that debate to better understand what the climate challenge is for African countries and what the more feasible and appropriate solutions are. Yeah, I think I really resonate with that because even in India, you know, we're also a third world country. The, we don't pollute as much, but, you know, we have to meet the same benchmarks, so, you know, common but differentiated responsibilities. So do you have any role models or any, let's say, one particular event or, you know, multiple events that inspired you on this journey that you have undertaken? 
Um, so maybe I can say two things on that. Um, the first is that I think I just value knowledge, knowledge generation, knowledge creation. Um, and over the past couple of years, I had the fortune and the privilege of meeting people who have really excelled on this front. And they've done a very good job of not just creating and generating knowledge, like writing papers, thinking through challenges and all of those things. But they've tried to use that knowledge in meaningful, useful and impactful ways. And they've built something. So one person that I really admire is the current dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, Professor Nairi Woods. I think she's just an incredible person, not just the quality of her ideas, but the fact that she actually built that school. The school started in 2012 and today it's like globally renowned and it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, being able to use that knowledge to create a platform for others, uh, to incubate other kinds of talent, to mentor other people. I think that is absolutely uh, an incredible thing to accomplish. And I think it's something that I also aspire to. It's not just, you know, thinking through challenges, writing papers, writing books, being well known, but how to use those ideas to impact change. And very, very importantly, how to empower other people to think critically through the challenges that their own societies face, right? Have, providing that platform for others. So I think that is, a, I would say that is just a, an incredible thing. I guess maybe the second thing uh, on this front is that, uh, you know, as, as I've grown in this sphere of work, I do meet people who say, oh, I've read this thing you wrote, I agree, or I don't agree with it, but I can see where you're coming from. So just having people to start engaging with those ideas that one puts out, I think it's a, at least I find it fulfilling. Uh, it's something I've always wanted to do just to challenge the way people think about specific things, whether it's the management of natural resources, whether it's oil rich countries, uh, whether it's a climate challenge now, um, just being able to catalyze that shift in mindset. And increasingly, even yesterday, I went to an event and I met two different people and they were, I introduced myself to them. They were like, oh, I know you, I've read your papers. You know, for me, that that is something that I find very, very fulfilling. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does. So in pursuit of you know wanting to build these capabilities mentor talent so do you at some point in the near or distant future plan to go back to nigeria and build capabilities knowledge awareness there that's a very good question and i don't know if i have a straightforward answer to it what i'm gonna say though is uh the world we live in today in 2022 with all of the technologies we have at our disposal, uh, that in a way time and space have been really compressed by new technologies. Uh, the ability to impact change does not necessarily depend on your physical location. Um, so I think for me, whatever platform allows me to be able to impact more change, to empower more people, for them to think critically um, it's something I would always gravitate towards, uh, whether it's here in the US, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's, uh, who knows, one day I might find myself in India or Singapore, you know. Uh, but on a serious note, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's more the kind of work that one does rather than the physical location, as we have tools at our disposal now. I mean, we're doing this interview via Zoom. Um, yeah, so I, I think the situation is slightly different from what it was uh, a couple of decades ago where you had to physically be in a place um, to be able to impact change and to cat catalyze change in thinking. Yeah, I think that also makes sense. You know, you 
living in the US and being vocal and spreading awareness with stakeholders in the states about issues in amongst the countries of Africa. So New African Magazine listed you as one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2021 and referred to you as the fearless analyst of African issues. So apart from being, you know, a voice, what are some of the goals that you hope to achieve through your work? Um yeah, I that description was very interesting, fearless analyst. <laughs> <laughs> It always seemed as if I had like a you know like a weapon and I was like going around. Uh, anyways, um, uh, I guess I I don't know if I have more to add to what I said earlier about uh, first of all just generating good quality knowledge, right? So not just giving opinions and doing commentary. No, actually doing good quality rigorous research. but research that addresses challenges that we face uh, i think there's also space for doing like esoteric research that you just find interesting but personally what i find more fulfilling is using those tools around knowledge generation knowledge production to address challenges that we face and we have a lot of them and then catalyzing a shift in thinking uh and empowering other people too given a platform for others so for me i think that's the that's ultimately what i really aspire to do and and you know with the work that i'm doing right now the africa program there's an element of that you know we're building a program hiring people and constantly looking out for new talent people who do meaningful useful work on africa uh you know, for them to publish with us uh to host them at our events etc Uh, so that really for me is the main thing uh, i would say what i really aspire to that sounds good so looking back at this journey that you've had and now you're in the states are there any lessons that you'd like to share and like what would you like to tell young professionals especially minorities on navigating a white male dominated world um so the first thing is i don't know if um my own experience is entirely replicable i think everyone has their own journey in life at the same time uh reflecting on my own experience i would say maybe a few things one is um um uh, you know you have to do the work you know sometimes you do think there are shortcuts and you know, occasionally uh you know luck can smile down upon you and you know, doors open but you have to do the homework you have to do the groundwork you have to invest in building some capability in something you know are you good with numbers are you good with writing are you good with people are you good with organizing stuff right you know there are people, some people who are not they're probably good at like they're not that analytical but they are they deliver you know you give them a task they're going to do it excellently well so just think of you know building some kind of skill set you have to do that work you have to do that homework um so that's the first thing uh because after all uh, uh as you know this ancient philosopher said luck is when uh opportunity meets uh preparation something like that right so such that when that opportunity opens up you are prepared for it i think the second thing is um think about building relationships and alliances uh and what i've come to realize is that the people who can help you uh maybe the people who can help also they may not necessarily always look like you you know some of my biggest allies today are not people who look like me uh you know, they are maybe they're white men <laughs> uh you know just because someone looks a certain way doesn't mean that they're going to act in a stereotypical way uh so really focus on building relationships think of where interests align um yeah and 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 make that count So maybe those two things I would say building relationships uh not don't burn bridges unnecessarily 
and be willing to compromise on certain things. You know, life is not black and white. Um, you're not always right. Another person is not always wrong. Try to understand where people are coming from, their point of view, uh, and then see how you can meet them halfway. Um, yeah, so maybe those are the things that I might say that that uh, you know, young people should think about. That's very interesting and, you know, enlightening because as a young person to hear that. So this was very wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to learn from you and hear your thoughts and views. To our audience, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Do subscribe to Carnegie India's YouTube channel for viewing similar content. Thank you.